If, especially when we're moving into kind of a new small group thing, um, especially something that may not be familiar to you because I think it's helpful to get a feel for what, you know, what the hope is, what the outcomes are hopefully going to be, uh, as well as what it's going to look like. And we have several different types of groups represented here. We've got, of course, our discussion groups or small groups. We've got our Bible studies. And then we've got um, some dinners for 8 and 10, I guess, depending on their, how many are at their tables. So um, and each of these groups will be doing somewhat of a different thing. And so we'll try to touch on all of that tonight. But as we dive in here, let's start with this. And I want you at your table to share a time when you felt truly welcome. And then share how you knew. No. All right, you go first. Folks, take about another minute. Okay. Well, no, it's a good one, so it's working. Honestly, I would say it's rare that I've ever felt welcome walking into a church for the first time. So it's really, really? I have felt so like fresh meat at the butcher shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was more like what can you do for us and why don't we do this? You can start to communicate if you wish to rather than just. To answer your question, I think the one thing that was many, many years ago, Sue and I were. It was a New Year's Day party that was hosted by some friends of Sue's parents. And I remember, I didn't know these people from the But for I went in there, and um, Larry, the homeowner, I came in the door, I said, Jim, I am so glad you could be here. He knew me from the wedding, of course. I memorized everybody's name. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, he, he walked me in, he showed me around, made me a drink and handed it to me, which impressed me. And, and it was, I've got like, I think you've got anybody else? Okay, this is going to be nice. I can relax a little bit. Yeah, be comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't being asked to do anything if that yeah. wasn't being done. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's always a pleasant thing. Being listened to and acknowledged and joining on the time. Yeah, first time you came here. Yeah. Single guy walking in the door. 
You were? Yeah. I mean, I know you've been here. Kathy was Catherine. Oh. So I was here by myself. Yeah. And Cliff Corbett and Jerry Blessing. They had a point of coming up and introducing themselves to me and asking me my name. When you have a last name like Flieger, mm -hmm. you don't even get No. Most people don't even try. Nice. Two weeks later, I came back, and both of them called me by name. So they have their phone back. Wow. Because <laughs> you don't know the same messages. Message. Yeah. You can see, like, the preview of, yeah. you know what I wanted to say? You think that also understood the whole listening to you. Yeah. And he was half listening and half not. He cared enough to remember. And some shit could have been that would put it on you. Some people are. 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 Yeah, it's hard, yeah. I think, is, is you have a little bit of a gift. Yeah. All right, I'm going to bring us back if I can. I'm sorry to interrupt the good conversation. I hate to do that. Uh, so, what did you learn? Anything will have consequence? Name tags. Ah, name tags. Say more. They help because you it, it levels the playing field, as we were discussing, and gives you... A, way to greet a person instead of saying something impersonal like, hey, you, or... <laughs> yeah. I've been known to respond to that, but yeah, you're yeah. right. <laughs> Smiles, hugs like they do when they're greeting. Uh, yes. Yes. It's important. Yeah. You feel very welcome. Excitement. Uh -huh. Excited to see you. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I asked you to to try to answer this question because I, I imagine on the one hand it's an easy question to answer but on the other hand I imagine it's a little difficult. Um, the way we think about welcoming and the way we define this word welcome says a lot about how we understand hospitality. And part of the reason we're doing this series is that the church as a whole, not just Southminster, but as a whole is in a place right now where you could argue that we're not doing very good at this. And that is evident by a lot of different factors. Whether it's the stuff happening in the Catholic Church, stuff that's happened in our own presbytery. Um, it's the, the shrinking sizes of churches. Um, you know, we've seen in our presbytery a number of churches close. Um, the shrinking number of families and young people that we see in our church. You know, all these are indications that we may need to evaluate what does it mean to be a welcoming place. And so to start tonight, we're going to open a prayer that I want to share my story of welcoming with you. So why don't we pray and then we'll dive in. Loving and gracious God, I thank you that we can be here tonight. I thank you for drawing us to this place and welcoming us to this place. We thank you for your presence in this place, God. I thank you for everyone here tonight and for their leadership and their willingness to facilitate this series. And God, we pray and ask for the wisdom to see and to hear your spirit as it moves. And we pray, God, that we recognize and can experience your welcome here. And as always, we ask that your will and not our will be done. In your name we pray. Amen. So my story of welcoming, welcoming started about a year, year and a half ago. Um, which doesn't sound like that long ago. I was, at that time, serving uh, Calvary Presbyterian Church in Round Lake, and I'd been there just under six years, and I was kind of at that stage where I was beginning to burn out. Um, it wasn't that I didn't enjoy what I was doing, it's just that I was in a church that I knew was going to be closing, so there wasn't a lot of, let's just say, hope in the ministry that I was doing. Most of the ministry I was doing was geared towards helping them to start having these difficult conversations and making these hard decisions. And um, I got to the point where I was just thinking, okay, what am I going to do? I was not really enjoying ministry. Um, I was starting to feel a little just exhausted um, and just not in a good place. So I started considering, you know, and asking the question, am I supposed to still be in ministry? Am I supposed to still be a pastor? And um, it was kind of an up and down journey. I mean, I'm not going to say it lasted a long time, but um, there were a lot of different conversations with a lot of different people about trying to, looking for guidance as to what I should do. And it was about, oh, not long before Easter, I picked up 
I don't know how I came across it, but I picked up this book called God's Welcome by Amy Oden. And, you know, I think I picked it up because I was curious to know more about what does radical hospitality look like in the church and that kind of thing. And I wasn't exactly, you know, I wouldn't say enthusiastic about it, but I was certainly curious. Well, after reading this book, my life changed. Now, I know it sounds strange to say a book can change your life. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but in this case, that was certainly the, what happened, and it happened because as I was reading this book, I began to see where my place was in ministry as a pastor. Began to find and see sort of where my passion as a pastor uh, was, and that's in this area of hospitality. And so, as I read through this book. And I did the meditations in it and, you know, just kind of wrestled with everything in the book. Um, vision, a vision became, began to take shape in my head. And it started out with saying, okay, I know, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here at Calvary, but I need to make sure I'm doing whatever I can to make this as fulfilling and as impactful as I can. And so for a long time, I had toyed with doing uh, a podcast and a blog. I'd always wanted to do that. And, uh, but I could never find something to do it on. Um, that's the problem with a podcast and blog. If you have nothing to, to talk about or to write, it doesn't do you much good. So after reading this book, though, I'm like, okay, this is it. This is what I want to do. And so starting in May of last year, I began putting together this podcast called Rummaging Through the Cupboards. And um, the name, I should tell you, actually came from a vacation. Uh, we were at a friend's house out in California. It would have been in June of 2018. And um, they were so hospitable. Um, they welcomed us into their home. I mean, this was Jessica's best friend. They'd known each other since they were like that tall, so a long time. And uh, I remember at one point they just said, you know, look, go, go, you know, the forks in the kitchen, you can go find them. You know, feel free to dig, look around, see if you can find them. And um, at that point, I sort of felt like, okay, I sort of feel welcome here. You know, I no longer need to worry about pretense. I can just go and find what I need. You know, if I want something to drink, I can get it. If I want something to eat, I can get it. Um, you know, we can just be ourselves here. No judgment, no, no worry about, you know, making the wrong move, saying the wrong thing. Just feel very welcome. So after I got back, I started to think about that more and more. And that's what kind of gave the name to the title was that, you know, rummaging through the cupboards. That's the, that's an indication of true hospitality when you're allowed into a place and you can just rummage through their cupboards without the fear of judgment pretense or uh, and do it with their blessing so anyway when I got back I started lining up interviews for the podcast and they just fell into place one right after another including one with Amy Oden who wrote the book and um, it just sort of took off and unfortunately this last November because of the transition from Calvary to here the podcast got put on hold but I've since got it going again but anyway the other thing that this did, the podcast and the blog were one thing. The other thing that it did, and this was maybe the more powerful part for me, was that it gave Jessica and I, as a couple, sort of a purpose. Because we realized that what we really want to do, the ministry that we want to do together, and this is something I um, I'd always wanted to share in ministry with my wife. That's something that's always been important to me. Um, and we decided that, and we felt this call, that the kind of ministry we were going to do is hospitality. We were going to when we bought our house, invite people into our home for dinner, conversation, you know, that type of thing. And so we bought a house this last May, as you know, and started, about a month or so ago, we started doing this because we got a dining room table. Before that, we had no tables in our house. It's hard to have people over for dinner when you don't have a place for them to sit. It's not very hospitable. Um, we started, but we started inviting people over, and we've had people coming over just about every week or we've gone somewhere, and it's just been amazing. And so my story of welcome is this. As I was experiencing this hospitality of God, both opening my eyes to you know, what it is that I really wanted to do with my ministry, uh, including the fact that I wanted to stay in ministry, coupled with this call that my wife and I both felt, um, that's led us to this place. And in the process of understanding that and making our this journey that we've taken to get here, um, you know, there's just been so many times where you know we've experienced hospitality around along the way. One other thing I will share with you because I think it's important 
is that when I started realizing that this is the hospitality is where I wanted to focus my ministry when I was at Calvary, I sat down and I told our session that I was going to do this, and I rewrote my entire job description. And the job description was centered around this concept of hospitality. Because before it just felt like I was doing random things sort of all over the place. And so now it felt like it was more symmetrical with what my call was. And um, they, were, they were good with it. Now, part of the reason I did that too is because I followed a 42-year pastor. And it felt like, you know, in my first four or five years there, we were trying to figure out what kind, you know, who I was going to be. They sort of wanted me to be more like him, which is understandable. I knew I couldn't be like him. And so, you know, part of establishing myself there was creating a job description that separated myself from him. And um, I was able to do that because I knew how I wanted to move forward in that role. And that also helped me to lead them as they were making the tough decisions and having the tough conversations about closing. And um, so anyway, that is my story of being truly welcome. And I think it's important for you to hear as we move forward tonight, because then now you have an idea of where we're coming from and why this is important to me. Um, because it really did change my life, and in some indirect way, it renewed me and sort of saved me, if I can, if I can go as far as to say that. All right, so let's talk about God's welcome here for a second. Here's my first question for you. What does hospitality mean to you? When I say the word hospitality, what do you think of? Being a good host. open to what other people bring to share or ask and being non-judgmental yeah yeah anyone else okay kind of let that question percolate in your mind as we work our way through we may revisit that so in this book God's Welcome Amy Odin wrote this a number of years ago she defines hospitality as gospel hospitality. In gospel hospitality, she defines as God's welcome into abundant life, into God's own life. Now, gospel, now, what does that mean? Well, gospel hospitality, we believe as Christians, is at the core, at the heart of the Christian faith, and that it's grounded in the incarnation. And so, what does that mean? Now, when I say incarnation, do you know what I mean? I'm talking about Jesus becoming flesh. So, John 1, 4 says, the Word became flesh and lived among us. Now, what's interesting is, the word that they use there, whether you translate it as live or dwelt, it literally means pitching a tent or making a home. Um, so, what that means is, when Jesus came here, he pitched a tent. He made a home here. And he did that by taking on flesh and blood and becoming a human being. Um, and so, as a result, Jesus experienced the full range of being human. Um, he welcomed human nature, if you will, and then he restored it. That's kind of the amazing part of the Jesus story. As you think about he came as a full flesh and blood person and therefore experienced the fullness of being human, and then he goes on to redeem and restore it through his act on the cross and, of course, the empty tomb. And by doing that, he also then restored us. He redeemed us as well. And uh, the word that we use to describe that is salvation. Uh, kind of a churchy word, but it gets the point across. Now, what's amazing about this is by taking on human, human skin, by becoming flesh and blood, is that Jesus did welcome this human nature, um, which means he welcomes us for who we are, for where we are. So when we come to him, uh, or he comes to us. That's maybe a better way to think of it, right? Because Jesus came to us. We didn't go up to him. So when Jesus came to us, he came to us as we were. And there was no judgment. There was no pretense. He just came. And he took on human skin, human flesh. And he learned, you would think, what it was like to be human. But through that, he then he was able to save us. And that takes it back to the salvation piece. And we're going to talk about that more later. Um, so does that make sense? That's, that's why we say hospitality is at the core of who we are as Christians. Because first God welcomed us through Jesus's, Jesus taking on flesh, his act on his ministry, his act on the cross, the empty tomb. 
And then by redeeming us, then he charges us. You can use the Great Commission if you want to, the Great Commandment, however you want to articulate it, in order to go out and show that same hospitality and welcome others the same way. So what does that mean for us? Well, let's start here. Um, hearing, God's, or hearing hospitality described that way, when have you experienced God's welcome in your life? And we're, by the way, going to do more small group stuff tonight, but this opening piece I want us to do is a large group, and I'll explain why. So when have you experienced God's welcome in your own life? Ah, very nice. Well, I can think of a time... I was in the process of moving up here, and I was with another couple and another friend of mine from high school, and our car broke down on I-55. It was below zero. Some guy stopped and that. He couldn't fix the car. He took us back to his house. Mm. Now here's four total strangers. And basically, we slept in his living room until the gas station opened up the next morning that had a record that could go out and get the car. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Any others? Sometimes God's welcome comes in the form of knowing he's there or direction that he's offering him. It could be with the word, it could be reading a book like a book of you, that's what happened to me. And he, he kind of lets you know he's there and he kind of stirs your heart up. And so to me, that's the opening or changing of your heart is experiencing his welcome. He's wel welcoming you in when you need it, when you're struggling. I was struggling. I wasn't sure what I was doing. I was So a sense of renewal, sort of. Well, I wasn't renewed because I didn't know how to pray and I didn't know the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, uh, he just came and uh, just uh, accepted me as I was. Let's put it that way. Yeah. That, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Accepted me as where you're at. So I don't know if you could hear this, and this is kind of the second question, is what role have others played in your experience of God's welcome? Have you noticed that... God's welcome is one of those things that we can only experience when someone else is involved, whether that's God directly or other people. And that's an important thing because we don't live in a vacuum. Um, we don't live our whole lives as just an individual person doing our own thing. We need other people. We need the relationships we have with other people, the community that we have with other people, and the community we have with God to truly experience what we would call the fullness of life. Um, otherwise, we feel a little bit empty. So think about times where you've experienced God's welcome. What role have others played in your experience of God's welcome? We kind of heard from Rick. I mean, that was a pretty obvious example. And um, was it, yeah, and Ellen, you know, John mentioning you, of course. Um, I can relate to that with my own wife a little bit. Um, what about the rest of you? Yeah, Jim. You know, I'm having a hard time kind of coming to grips with it because I'm not sure I've ever experienced what we were calling God's welcome. Sure. Some of the things that we seem to me to be very important parts of it are ex immediate acceptance, yes. that you are part of the group. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of loving unconditionally. And you know, I've been racking my brain trying to think of that. And one of my very first memories, I'm probably only three or four years old at this time, we had driven in our 57 Ford to visit my grandmother in Kansas, this is my mother's mother. They lived in a basement house. My grandfather just never got around to building a top on it or never intended to. But there was a, a low spot in the dirt and you could see the doorway. And when we pulled up, it was pouring rain. And my grandmother, is waiting at the door and she comes out and she's got an umbrella and I don't think she'd ever seen me before. At least I don't recall it. And she picked me up out of the back of this car, gave me a big hug 
I dragged me back inside. I don't think I got my sister. But it was kind of like, I knew that she loved me. She was there to make sure that I got in as untrammeled by the journey as possible. And uh, I felt safe. You know, for one, having a hard time get, getting your head around this, I think you got it pretty well. Yeah, yeah I mean, you did. <laughs> Yeah. Safe, safe is a big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Safety is a huge deal. And, you know, one thing I, I do want to say, too, Jim, to about what you said is this is not something you're going to get your head around at a simple facilitator's training. Mm -hmm. All right. And we'll, we'll talk more about this later, but this is a long term process. It's all about changing our perspective, the way that we see ourselves, the way we see God, the way we see the world. And that takes practice, you know, lack, for lack of a better word, practice. And as you do it more, and it becomes a bigger part of who you are, it just begins to make a little bit more sense. Um, so, anyone else? And sometimes you go into something and you're, you open the, you know, welcome somebody in, but you never expect that it's, it's going to end up they're going to welcome you in. I mean, it's a two-way street, mm -hmm. in other words. So you, by you taking a risk and stepping out, there's a response back, and then each one is blessed from the other. I mean, that's kind of a, just kind of a thing mm -hmm. that can happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you think about your experiences of God's welcome, and if you're still having a hard time getting your head around this, that's okay. Okay, there, this is no pressure, no... Uh, no pretense, no obligation here. It's just getting, trying to get your brain going a little bit. Um, so as you think about this, what changed in your life as a result of God's welcome? Friendships have become much more deep mm -hmm. and meaningful. Mm -hmm. One nine years of this. <laughs> <laughs> At every moment, perfect, right, John? <laughs> Not bad out of 56, is it, John? <laughs> <laughs> to be a better listener because of the people that I was interacting with. This, this was a church-related event, and I was looking for people to help me understand what was going on at this event. Mm -hmm. And so these people were mentors to me, explaining and introducing me to other people or other parts of the event. And so I learned that I didn't know it all, and what changed, it, it did make me a better listener and open to new ideas and the fact that, hey, we're all here for a Christian reason and we all have different views of Christ and how he lives in us. So that opened my eyes to, to uh, people who are different from me. Mm. Awesome. That's a great one. I think... Um, One of the lessons I've learned is, is that every human being wants to be acknowledged and usually welcome, unless they're a criminal element or just have a really internal focus type thing. Any, anyone in any setting. And it's those unintentional interactions when you see that there's another human being <clears throat> inside of that person. You know, in, the, in, the, in, in my experience, it's been the awkwardness of human beings on an elevator in North America. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you just are, I'm shocked by how people respond when you look at them or you talk to them. <laughs> some are eager to talk, some inch away and hold on to the side rail. But I learned never to discount every person I run into if there's a chance to say something or, or a conversation comes up is, is, is to look at them as a human being first not as the baggage handler in O'Hare, or or this guy that was huffing and puffing because the, the train was like coming out of downtown, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's opened up some wonderful conversations. Mm -hmm. um, that leads to other conversations, um, and I think that's because some of the seeds of what you're helping lead us through have been planted in us over a Christian journey, mm -hmm. hopefully. Yeah, I was gonna say, that, that would be the hope, right? I mean, um, yeah, so first of all, 
having to think about these questions, how many of you found this to be kind of a difficult exercise? Okay. How many of you found it to be a little uncomfortable? How many of you found it easy? <laughs> Good. So, here's the deal. When you start, when you come into your group as a facilitator, you're going to be coming into a room full of people that are going to be in all sorts of different places on the spectrum in terms of their understanding of hospitality, of welcoming, um, plus are coming from a whole variety of experiences with this. Some are going to have some really positive experiences, some maybe not. You may even hear someone say, well, I don't know that I've ever experienced that in my life. And so, you know, you as facilitators, a big part of your job is to play this role of host and to help to create space where all of those perspectives, all of those experiences can coexist. And that's the beauty of being able to do this at small groups is that um, as a facilitator, you can turn it over to the small groups. They can talk. It's a smaller group. And, uh, but you can lead that. You can lead that by sharing your own experiences of this, like almost all of you did. Uh, and that's a great way to help people that have not done this before, or who may find it scary, uncomfortable, hard, to kind of start thinking about it and to start talking about it. And the reality is, as we all know, people love to talk about themselves. So once you get them started, you know, you're, off, you're in good shape. Um, and this is going to be a great way, especially for the Bible study, to start off. Um, in the back of the book, and we'll talk more about this in just a bit, where the studies are, that's where these questions came from. Um, and so they're a great way to start. They're also a great way to kind of, again, get your brain going, thinking about the last week, you know, where you experience God's welcome before you start moving in to the scriptures. So, Does um, everybody have a book? Tonight? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Mm -hmm. I'll look at you. We've got a few extras, I think. Yes, we do. Uh, if you're both doing it, would you like to each have one? Sure. Thank you. All right, so your job as facilitator is you're essentially playing host. So when we talk about God's wealth, welcome, there's this interplay, there's this inner dynamic of host and guest. So as a group facilitator, whether that's at a Bible study or you're at the dinner for eight or you're doing a small group, you're the host. So as the host, you set the tone when you come in. You're the one that makes sure that the group that you're leading knows what they're doing. Um, and you're going to be the one that, in this case, because this is a little different, and it is something that I think you'll find as you go really opens the door to some amazing conversation. But at the same time, too, it could be a little uncomfortable for people. So you set the tone as the host, and you so however you set your room up, however you welcome people to start out with, however you introduce these topics, um, how you do your teaching, all of that, you're kind of in that role. So bottom line, what I'm getting at, as host, it's important for you to be prepared when you come into the room. And again, the beauty of, of the doing it as a small group with tables and stuff is that you don't have to worry as much about teaching. It's going to be more experiential, more conversational, and that, that's what we want. Um, so don't be afraid to let it go there. All right, so why we're here tonight then is to learn how we be this welcoming host, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time with. And um, so we're going, to, we're going to start by walking through what a typical Bible study is going to look like. And then we'll also talk about the meditations for those of you that are here for the Dinner for Eight and the, and the uh, discussion groups. Um, and then we'll look at calendar schedule and go through all the nuts and bolts, okay? So before we get too much further, any questions, concerns, thoughts? All right. We're going to jump in the deep end. So does everybody have a Bible or have one accessible? I know I asked you to come to church, but... Yeah. <laughs> on my phone. Yeah, that's why I say accessible, because that, yeah, yeah. It's on my phone. Yeah. Yeah, I would have them available. Uh, 
Well, I yeah. Part of what I would do as facilitators, folks, uh, for your group, is when you have an opportunity, just send a message out to the people, letting them know if they want to get a hold of the book, God's Welcome, that, that either we have it or where they can find it, um, which is on Amazon, or we can get it cheaper for them through the publisher. Uh, but the other thing, too, is if they have a Bible to bring one. If not, we have them here. So um, no worries there. So let's go to John 4. And we're not going to look at this whole thing, but we'll look at enough of it to have our conversation. Uh, this is the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, how many of you are familiar with this story? Good. So take just a quick glance at it, just to re as a refresher, and then we'll dive in here. So to give you a little context on this story, so you kind of know what we're diving into here. Um, and I don't know what you all know versus what you don't know. So if you know some of this or you know all of it, then bear with me. So Jesus was going through Samaria. And Samaria was the shortest distance between Judea and Galilee. So he was on his way back to Galilee. And it just so happened Samaria was the easiest way to get there. However, it was normally avoided because Jews and Samaritans would avoid contact with each other. They were not, let's just say, friends. And, um, and this goes back to Old Testament times when the Assyrians had conquered Israel and then resettled in Samaria. Now, the first five books of the Bible, which we call the Pentateuch or the Torah, was considered scripture to both Samaritans and to the Jews. Um, but they disagreed on how to practice their faith. I mean, that's really what it came down to. This spot where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman was a holy spot for the Samaritans in some ways very similar to, um, let's see, it might be something like, uh, well, the Temple Mount or something like that in Jerusalem. Um, and so there was this really, really strong tension between Jews and Samaritans. Um, and as you, if you read through the conversation, you can see it there. You can almost feel it, really, that tension that's between them. Um, and it kind of runs through the entire dialogue. Although what's interesting about the dialogue, and you may have noticed this, is that the dialogue, the tone of the dialogue, because of her reactions to Jesus or how she addresses Jesus, changes. And so you can see some progress, if you will, um, and some letting go of that tension in the passage. So um, let's start with this. Who offers hospitality in this story? standing in front of it. Alright, 
So who offers hospitality in this story? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Okay, that's the obvious answer. I'll give you that one. Anybody else? I'm not sure I see any hospitality, at least in this book. <laughs> she challenges him, and he challenges her right back. He asks for water. She says, how dare you ask me for water? And he says, if you knew who was asking. But he offers her living water. Later on. Yeah, I don't think he ever gets a drink in the story. <laughs> I know, I feel badly. You might be right. Of course, the question was, was he really looking for one? Yeah. Yeah, John. Hospitality is a two-way street. And she responds at the end. And somebody responds to you. That's an invitation. Yeah, I think so. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier, that we don't exist in a vacuum. That oftentimes our experience of hospitality involves and is even dependent upon others. Yeah, so let's start with Jesus here with this story. So his first request is what? Give me a drink. Okay? Now, for most of us, that seems like an ordinary request, pretty harmless. Um, but how does the Samaritan woman respond? Well, I think she's really far off guard. Mm -hmm. Here's a man talking to her, and obviously he's not a Samaritan. And right. she doesn't know how to respond. And that's the key. And he, he, he kind of asks her, he gives her a command. He's not, how are you today? Do you have water, or could you draw water for me? Mm -hmm. So, not exactly uh, warm words are exchanged. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is where we see hospitality first in this story, because exactly what you said. She responds, her exact words are, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me, or ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? So it is clear that this is not a request that she expected, that it is far from the ordinary. And it reveals the cultural and religious biases that were present between these two groups of people. Not just cultural, it's male and female. Right. It's violating their social Probably. codes. A man yeah. would not talk yeah. to a woman who was not a member of his family. Or his yeah, very, very possibly. I think that's, that when I did this study originally, that was not something that came up, so I'm glad it came up here. All right, so then, does Jesus, Jesus has two possible reactions here. He can say, okay, fine, and keep on his way, but what does he actually do? He engages her. He engages her, and that in and of itself is a form of welcome, is a form of hospitality. Um, now, that's easy for Jesus. For us, it's a whole different story, <laughs> right? But he continues to engage her, and he says to her, let's see, if you knew the gift of God, and who is that? Let me make sure I got the right one. Uh, yeah. If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So then the woman says to him back, what? Mm -hmm. She labels him, or he, she says, sir. So now it's no longer Jew, it's Sir, just a simple stranger. Um, and so you can see that tension starting to be released just a little, not much, just a little. And so then Jesus says, um, she asked where do you get that living water? She said, sir, you have no bucket, the well is deep, where do you get that living water? So her understanding of what Jesus is saying here is certainly still more physical, more literal. You know, she's thinking of... Um, you know, you don't have any buckets. Where are you going to get this from? The well is way down there, so I don't know how you're going to get it without a big bucket. You know, she's taking a much more literal approach to this. And, um, and then she says, Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and his, with his sons and his flocks who drank from it? And again, this is where we see that cultural tension come into play. Because now she's, she's you could argue, kind of pushing Jesus a little bit, wanting to find out exactly who he thinks he is. Uh, because as far as she's concerned, Jacob is the, is, is the one that, um, well, is the important one in this story. It's, and is the one that provides the living water. Because again, the literal interpretation, he's the one that found this well. So how could you be better than him? Um, and that's when Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give 
will give them become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternity. Which the woman says again, sir, give me this water. That I may never be thirsty or keep coming here to draw water. So Jesus continues to engage her. And as he continues to engage her, there's this deepening of relationship that's happening. Because now he's, for lack of a better word, he's hooked her, right? You know, she's very curious to know what is going on here. And so, but Jesus didn't just dive in, right? Like he didn't respond to the bar about him being a Jew, whether she meant it that way or not. Instead, you know, he kept the focus on, um, you know, first on why he was there and then, you know, how he might be able to play host to her. Um, and so that's where we start seeing him offer this hospitality. Um, all right, so let's see. We'll stop on that there. So, so what does this hospitality look like? So if we're saying Jesus is offering hospitality, what does it look like? He engaged her ultimately to know more mm -hmm. about God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now what is... Jen, I think you're 100% right. So what is, why is that significant? Why is that a form of hospitality, a form of welcoming, just simply engaging her? Well, he looked beyond his own physical need mm. for water and cared enough about her and what was inside her to keep kind of peeling back the onion mm -hmm. and get to know her. And he knew of her, obviously, because he knew of her husband's, plural, <laughs> um, so he already knew, but he, he got her engaged and opening up in the conversation. Yeah. So, yeah, he looked past the fact that she was Samaritan, which could have been strike one. He looks past the fact that she was a woman, which could have been strike two. And he looks past the fact that she'd been married several times, which could have been strike three if this had been just a normal, average, ordinary Jew that had encountered her. And he was continuing to engage her, which is a form of acceptance, right? A form of welcoming. So you go back to... What we talked about with Jesus in the Incarnation, about how um, Jesus welcomes human nature. So this woman is a great example of human nature. Maybe not the same human nature that we have, but of her human nature. And Jesus welcomes her for who she is, where she is. And doesn't try to, you know, doesn't judge her, doesn't do anything, at least not yet. Um, she trusts him to give her the water so she yes. never be thirsty again. Yes. He's learning to trust. He's yes. learning. learning he's a safe place yeah. because he was he didn't feel that safety. It didn't come right away, but then mm -hmm. he started to trust him. So what does that teach us about hospitality? It has to be open. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be open and it takes time. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's also a mutual thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, moving to the next part of the story, Jesus says to her, go get your husband and come back. And then, of course, the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said, yep, you're right. I have, you don't have one, you have five. Okay. Or I've had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. Um, so what you said is true. So then how does the woman address him after that? He's a, He's a prophet. So put yourself in her position. If Jesus, if this had been the first thing out of Jesus' mouths to you when he got to that well and you were sitting there, what would your reaction have been? Stunned. <laughs> Startled. Yeah. Freaked out. Freaked out. Mm -hmm. How many of you would have been offended and would have said, who do you think you are? I mean, how many of our conversations in our world today start with comments like that? Maybe not revealing a deep truth about somebody, but being very blunt about something that speaks directly to a person's life, whether we realize it or not, and the conversation is cut off right there. So Jesus worked his way up to that point. And that's why she was able to address him as prophet. Because, like many of you said, he had built up some trust there. He had welcomed her for who she was. And so when Jesus says this, um, she's, he's not, let's see, I want to make sure I get this right. Um, let's see. 
Anyway, so when he's saying this, he's not saying it as a judgment. He's not saying it at, you know, trying to reveal her sin to her even. It's more just identifying that this is who she is. This is her human nature. Um, well, he's aware. Of yeah, and that he's, he is aware of it. Um, but the fact that she calls him prophet also shows, too, that she's starting to warm up to him a little bit and is not offended by him knowing this. In fact, she's astonished that he knows this, and that's why, of course, he calls him a prophet, because only a prophet would know that. Um, and then she goes on to say, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on the mountain, on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is Jerusalem. And so that was the big difference between Samaritans and Jews. If you were a Jew, your place of worship was the temple in Jerusalem. If you were a Samaritan, it was here at Jacob's well in Samaria. Um, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Um, and then there's this little interlude down here where the disciples show up, and uh, that's when she went away back to the city. And um, she was saying to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left, the, they left the city and were on their way. But the last thing that she says to him, did you, um, did you catch that? It's way towards the end. Um, let me see if I can... Yeah, it's starting at about 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. So you can see this movement on the part of the woman. Because what ultimately then does she go and do after Jesus makes his statement that I am the one that she had, had heard about? What's her next move? Goes into the city and tells the people, come see yeah. someone who's told me yep. everything I ever did. Yep. So we see this movement on the woman, starting out with one that's very much at a distance from Jesus, calling him Jew, but then starts to warm up and refer to him as sir. Then warms up even further, calling him prophet. And then at the end, her eyes are open. She sees him as Messiah. And so that's what gospel hospitality looks like. When we, show, when we show God's welcome to others, we help them in the same way Jesus helped the Samaritan woman. And we do so by our actions. This is not something that we can do just simply by talking. We talk too much in our culture. <laughs> um, it's more about how we live and, and our state of being. Now, what's interesting about this, and this is why I asked about what did she do next, is she went off and told other people. So in this story, she also offers hospitality. Because she goes and offers the same water, uh, theologically speaking, spiritually speaking, to the people of her village. And so God welcomed her, and she went off to welcome others. Now, again, as we've seen, it's up to them whether or not they accept that welcome. But she was willing to go and try to bring people along just as Jesus brought her along. Does that make sense? All right. So what sort of welcome, and this one's kind of obvious, if any, does God offer in this story? So this is more of a recap, but that's okay. Welcome to our Yep, the offering of living water, which is salvation, which is abundant life, full life, love, mercy. Absolutely. He shows us grace as well there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Accept that mm -hmm. God accepts you, that makes mm -hmm. yeah, it's a special thing that he has to change you to. Mm -hmm. I've often wondered what was the reaction of the people in the village? When she, a woman who was probably not well thought of, right. came true. back with this. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but that's Jesus' way. He often does that. He often found the least and the last. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, back then they would have been more open to it than they would have been today. Today they probably would say, oh, he's just some kook that's read something on the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, this is huge. So think about that. But they said, but it said they came to him because mm -hmm. of her testimony. Yes. So obviously. So, and that's again why we say she offered hospitality because she was able to bring others along that same journey. I think they sensed a change in her. Yeah. Yeah. And when yeah. you sense a genuine heart change, absolutely. So, what was God? How would you describe God's MO in this story? So that would be patience. Is that the, is that a fair word? Yeah. I think I'm gonna spell this wrong. Okay. Is that it? Okay, good. He's going after the lost sheep. I mean that's yeah. he did he didn't show a lot of emotion. I mean some people kind of bait you to try to catch you to you know yeah. yeah. So I hear you saying calmness. Yeah, mm -hmm. calmness. And Rick, I want to go back to what you were saying about didn't offer a 12-step program or a magic pill. Yeah. He offered her, what, presence? Just, uh, just non-judgmental, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, he was present and not judgmental. Yeah, you Except didn't have to do anything right. to get this living world. Didn't have to clean up her life. I think also an active listener. Mm -hmm. Listener, an active listener. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Instead of just saying the mm -hmm, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, I, mean. I imagine there were times Jesus would have rather said that. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> but instead he dug deep. Exactly. The Pharisees, he did say that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what you say. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So these are, these are your core questions that when you're facilitating, especially in the Bible study, that you're going to ask your people to explore. And so having some idea, and you'll actually do this story. This will be part of, this will be one of the Bible studies you do later on. So having a feel, as you're doing your preparation for, you know, backing up real quick, um, you know, who offers hospitality in this story? And opening yourself up to seeing not only how God offer, offers hospitality, but how do the other characters the other people in this story offer hospitality. Um, what does it look like? Because as you begin to get a feel for what God's hospitality looks like, it begins to change you as well. Because then you begin to realize, well, maybe what I think of as hospitality is not really what it is. And it just has this weird effect. I, for me, it had a weird effect on both my heart and my head because I began to see things differently. It changes your perspective. Um, and then recognizing, too, what kind of welcome, if any, does God offer helps you to go a little bit deeper, like in this story, of what Jesus was truly offering this woman. You know, it wasn't just physical, you know, literal water. It was salvation. It was renewal. It was mercy. It was love. It was presence. It was all the things that you guys said, that all of that um, comprised the welcome that Jesus offered this woman. And what happened? The woman accepted it. And she went off and, as a result, welcomed others. And then, of course, you know, at God's MO, which we talked about. Um, and this is important, too, because I think one of you mentioned that in our culture. We don't do what Jesus did in this story very well. You know, we don't do patience, calmness, non-judgment, you know, presence, active listening. We don't do any of that very well in our culture. Any um, of our leaders won't do that very well. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You don't something say that, it. It's something we've gotten away from. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that's a huge part of God's welcome and how we can share God's welcome with others. We talk about how this takes time. And obviously what happened in the story, we can argue, is going to be the, more the exception than the norm. But recognizing both the presence, the type of presence that's required, and then that it is going to take some time, but that we can build on that. That was the amazing thing I found in the story, is how the woman just kept coming along. And it wasn't because Jesus was like trying to pull her along, it was because Jesus kept um, affirming her, kept uh, being present for her, 
and didn't judge her because she didn't understand what was going on. I mean, it would have been really easy for Jesus just to kind of rub his head like, oh, you're just not getting it when she talked about, you know, where are you going to get a bucket and how are you going to get to the bottom of the well? But he didn't. So, all right. Questions, concerns, thoughts? That's essentially what one of these Bible studies, the Bible study portion would look like, yeah. I guess when you're dealing with people, sometimes you get this awkward silence. You know, it happened here a little bit where everybody's going, hmm, I don't know what to say. So how, how long do you kind of wait and what can you do to help? Yeah, so there's a couple things you can do. One, you can decide to do these questions or have these questions for them at the table and have them discuss it as a table. Um, you'll have to get a feel for your room. If you feel like you've got a lot of introverts, for example, in your group, having them do it in a smaller group is going to open them up more. Um, if it's a bunch of extroverts in the room, maybe a larger group will work better. That way they don't take over a conversation at a table. Um, so that would be one way. The other way is whenever you dive into something like this, especially the way that we are, it's going to be new. And so allowing that space where they can kind of wrestle with it and just being patient, that's one of the ways that you as a facilitator offer the same kind of presence that Jesus did to the Samaritan woman. So, you know, giving them a, you know, even if it takes a minute or two for them to kind of get there. Now, if you sense that no one's going to respond, then that's a good place just to kind of fill in and maybe give an example of what you see happening in the story. Um, or if it has something to do with one of the earlier questions, you know, an example from your own life. Um, you know, just to try to get the conversation going. Uh, because depending on your group, this could be new or it could be old hat. You never know. So, I yeah, John. What was interesting was that we, the questions were kind of based off of scripture, but all our responses were kind of subjective. Yeah. And there's no wrong answer. It's an opinion. It's a thinking mm -hmm. process out loud, which allows people to be maybe emboldened to share a different perspective. Yes. Um, so... That, that's huge because one of the things that we like to do as the church especially is we like to think there is a right answer and you know with this kind of thing you know Jesus there was certainly a right answer with what Jesus was trying to, to teach her but he wasn't giving her that answer she he was letting her get there on her own and she did um, that's another form of hospitality so you're 100 percent right Yeah, so if I follow, yeah, so what we're going to do, um, Kathy's, we're actually going to go through all of this here in just a few minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay. I didn't know if it was coming or not. It yeah, coming. it is coming. Okay, perfect. So I just, but I wanted to give you a feel for what the Bible study is going to look like, because I think that part is important. And, you know, there's going to be this fine line between teaching and facilitating and discussion, so you'll have to feel out your group to see just how much of each of those, you know, how much a piece of the pie each of those are going to take up. And with the teaching part, you know, if you need some help with that, let me know. If you want me just to type up some notes that give you some background on the, the scripture, I can do that. Um, I probably got most of them done already because I've done this before. So, you know, you just tell me what would be easiest and I'll be glad to, to accommodate. So um, it just really, the teaching part, it depends on how much you want to get into that. That can be a, both a slippery slope, but it can also be really helpful uh, in terms of understanding these passages and where hospitality is present. Uh, so think about that. We'll come back to that at the end. Um, any other questions? Any thoughts on this? How did this feel? Like, for you as a facilitator, knowing that you may lead something like this, um, what were some observations you have? How did it feel to you? Knowing that, you know, you think hospitality and, and, and it's way beyond a two-minute conversation when you're meeting someone in a church or something. It's, mm -hmm. it's building a relationship and, and showing that you care, um, especially regardless of what society may have labeled that individual as. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yeah, it, it's the beginning of a process is, is meeting that person and engaging, but it's, right. it's a long process. Right. Yeah, that's a good way to think of it, for sure. You have the book ahead of time, or have the questions ahead of time. You're getting hit with it, and mm -hmm. I've heard those questions, and yet when you put them up there, it's different than. So you make a good point there, Bob. So one of the things you can do is just put out there. Look, there's really no right answer to this. The other part is, you know, sometimes people will process out loud and use that processing out loud. I mean, it's very similar to what the Samaritan woman was doing. She was processing with Jesus out loud to help them kind of get to where it is that maybe either they're trying to get to or if there is a point you're trying to make, help them get to the point you're trying to make, whatever that might be. Anything else? Do you think it would be helpful if the people knew what the scripture passages they were going to have the week before so they could read them all? Yeah, what I always did is I, I would always tell people this is the scripture that we're going to look at for next week. And that, that was really helpful because then they would read it and once they got a feel for the format, they kind of knew what to and think about or what to look for. They have the same four questions, they would kind of know. Yeah. I think it's always helpful if they could put some thought into it. Yeah. I, I would, the difference in your discussion. So right. I would strongly encourage, you know, letting them know ahead of time. You know, each week when you get to the end of your session, say, okay, next week we're going to look at this passage. And, um, you know, it'll be the, and just let them know it's going to be the same format. Just different passages, so then they know kind of what to think, what to look for. Um, well, yeah. I think the second and or third time, yeah, you'll have a little less awkward. Yeah, well, and expect the first time to be the most awkward. <laughs> I mean, it's just the way it's going to be. And in the sense, too, if people know each other, mm -hmm. when we did our other study group, uh, people didn't know each other. Sometimes it's good to say, sometimes it's good to have some guidelines saying, I'm not an expert, we're all here to learn together, right. and, all, you know, your and your job as the facilitator, even though you're the host and you're the one that's responsible for making sure that everything's ready to go and prepared, that doesn't mean you're the expert. No. Um, and I think that's important to hear. We do have some guidelines, some other things that we've used, maybe four or five points, and that's one of them that we usually use. Maybe that we should just prepare a little something for them, sure. and they can pick and choose if they'd like to use that or not. Um, yeah, I would say God, right? that the way that this study is set up, and it's all in the book, it's all in the back of the book, which we'll go to here in a minute, um, keep it simple. You know, I mean, just, just follow the way it's laid out in the book, and you'll be fine. Um, and, you know, if you want to add some color to it, flavor to it, whatever, by all means. Um, but especially the first couple of weeks, just to make it easy on yourself, you know, just use the structure that the book recommends. And then as you get to know your group, then you can decide how you want to, you know, how you want to make it your own and adjust it to your group's needs. Um, I guess what I'm saying is keep it simple. That old, what was it, acronym, KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Um, kind of that same ideal here so all right any other questions so i think the, the thing that i realize is that there's you know a million great stories in the bible and verses about hospitality but other than like the bible study group who will be analyzing the words and the verses and maybe going back and forth the other group we're, we're taking the bible verse but we're pulling the concept up at a level that's more conversational that we yes can yeah. yeah that's a great way to look at it yeah absolutely um, one thing you can do to help that conversation, too, as a facilitator, is read through the passage and attempt to answer these questions we just did on your own. And then you can lead the group a little bit if, if you run into those periods of silent, awkward silence, which you probably will. Um, you know, then you can get the conversation started, because uh, sometimes that's all that, all that they need. All right, what I'd like to do briefly here is take a little pause, and then I'm going to run through um, kind of the study itself. We'll look at the back of the book. We'll look at the schedule all that kind of stuff, and then we'll uh, move into the closing piece, and there's a couple things I just want you to be aware of, a couple teaching things um, that I want to convey to you, and then um, we'll wrap it up. So let's just pause for a second, and uh, you guys need to use a restroom or grab something more to drink or whatever, let's do it. <laughs>